It's the greatest spectacle in sports. It was the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500. But before 350,000 people watched one of the most exciting races in recent memory, drivers and team members and workers and fans gathered just inside the track to celebrate Christ at both the Catholic Mass and at chapel service. David Storvik is the chaplain for IndyCar Ministry. He was the one that shared about John chapter 4. In 2016, we're working on a sermon series called Running the Race. And we're talking about running all aspects of this race we call life. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. At IndyCar Ministry, if you don't know us, we'd like to get to know you better. We'd like to run that race with you. Um, our mission at IndyCar Ministry is to share the hope of Christ and lead others in a growing relationship with Him. And we do that by building relationships, uh, sharing Christ, and developing disciples. So as you, as you are aware, today is kind of a big day. We've got a, we got a race going on, 100th running. That's a, that's, a, that's a huge milestone in any sporting event. Uh, a couple of other sporting events. Uh, uh, the Olympics were started in the 8th century B.C., uh, interesting factoid there. Uh, the Kentucky Derby has been run since 1875. The Rose Bowl has been played every year since 1902. But in motorsports, this is a very unique and special day. But today we're not here to talk about a track. Today we're not here to talk about an event or a race. As awesome as this race is, as awesome as this track is, we are here to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Uh, and today, and somebody's going to win this race today, right? I mean, there's going to be a winner at the end of 500 miles. In our lives, we're running a race as well. Uh, but at times, it's, it feels like sometimes we're not winning. At times, it feels like we can never get ahead. At times, it feels like our sinfulness and our humanness gets in the way of a relationship with our Creator, our God, and our Savior. The drivers in today's race will be exhausted at the end of 500 miles, and at times in this life we feel exhausted as well while we're running this race. And it feels like sometimes we're defeated uh, uh, by the race itself, this race of life. Today we're going to go to the story of a woman uh, who felt defeated. She felt the pain of rejection. She had felt judgment, condemnation. She had not felt loved. And she understood what it meant to run this race defeated. She was running her life defeated. This comes from the fourth chapter of John. I've got the whole text there in your, in your bulletin there, uh, but I'll just kind of summarize it here for you. So Jesus was walking through this region called Samaria, and it's just north of Jerusalem. And the passage tells us that Jesus was tired. It's interesting to note that Jesus was as fully God, fully human, he was tired. In this, in this instance, he was thirsty. So he went to the well in the middle of the day, it was about noon, to get some water from the well. Uh, and she knew that he was a Jew, and she, she also knew that he should not be associating himself with a Samaritan woman. That was kind of like taboo. But he replied and he said, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So the woman wanted some of this water that he was talking about, but he was not talking about the physical water itself. He told her, he said, you go and get your husband. And she says, I don't have one. And she's like, and Jesus said, he responded to the woman, he says, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you have five, you've had five husbands, and the man you now are with is not your husband. What you said is quite true. So the woman obviously noticed that uh, he was some sort of prophet. He responded in saying, Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. A time uh, has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. And she said, I know this Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he's going to explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I who you speak to am he. So in this race, this woman was running. She was at the well in the middle of the day. 
which is interesting to know because usually uh, the women would go early in the morning to get their water for whatever they needed to do in the day. And this, this, was, their, this was their Facebook, Twitter, Instagram time, you know, with the other, with the other women, you know, hanging out, hey, what's up, you know? Uh, but, uh, but not this woman, not this woman. She avoided that. She avoided that. She came to the well in the middle of the day. Uh, she was probably the talk of the town. Um, you know, she was taken back by the fact that a Jewish man uh, asked her for a drink of water. She was probably used to being ignored. She was probably used to being rejected. She was probably used to being talked about behind her back. You know, it's that woman. She probably felt defeated by this race that she was running. She was all alone at this well and up walks Jesus. And the response that Jesus had is pretty incredible. Uh, he broke through religious and uh, ethnic barriers to talk to this woman. He told her about this living water. And he was obviously talking about having faith in him for eternal life. That she would never thirst again uh, with a spiritual thirst that he was talking about. And then he told her that he was the Messiah that was coming. The other interesting response from Jesus was the lack of judgment and condemnation in this moment. Uh, I suspect the, when the woman found out that Jesus knew her past, uh, that she, she was prepared for the worst. But it never happened. It never happened. Jesus showed her love, he showed her compassion, and he showed her the way to eternal life. The story goes on with this woman, she, how she reacted to this news. She left her water jar there and she went back to the town running, I suspect. And remember, she had just made a deliberate effort to, to avoid the people in the town. She went running back to the town and she said, come see this man that could possibly be the Christ. The woman earlier in the day was filled with doubt and fear and condemnation. But now she was filled with wonder and hope and joy. The story goes on to say that many in that town believed in Jesus because of her testimony, which is just absolutely incredible. A woman once uh, condemn and ostracized basically from our own community was now the catalyst for the message of hope that Jesus provides. That's her story. That was her race. That was her struggle. And now Jesus was her hope. So the question I have for you on this historic day in motorsports is not where your seats are, not what driver you came to see and cheer on to victory, but what's your story? How's your race going? Do you feel defeated by the race that we call life? What's your struggle? What are you struggling with? And do you have hope? There are 33 drivers today that have the hope of winning the Indianapolis 500, especially the 100th running. You ask any driver out there uh, if they could win, and they would say yes. If they didn't think they could win, they wouldn't be in the race. And that's what it takes our approach to life not to be defeated but we have hope in Jesus so how do we do that in our everyday lives how do we do that last year uh, May 18th uh, at the Motor Speedway in an interview with uh, ABC James Hemcliffe says he doesn't, doesn't remember anything about the accident that day uh, he doesn't remember about the broken piece of suspension that pierced his leg or the safety crew pumping him with 14 pints of blood as they raced him to the hospital. He was down, but he was not defeated. Once his quit, he was uh, cleared from the, to return to the gym, he said, I was so motivated to get where I had to be that I kept pushing myself and pushing myself and pushing myself. And then talking about this month, he said, I came into the month of May really hoping that by the time we left, we'd have a new story to tell. We've taken a good step toward closing that chapter of last year and starting a new story. James had hope. He never gave up. He looked for the answer of whether he could return to racing again. He kept pushing for the hope of returning. The woman at the well that was once defeated, same thing. But now she had hope. And that's what it looks like in our lives with a major exception one major exception is we already have the answer on how not to be defeated. When Jesus Christ rose from that grave, 
On the third day, our battle was won. Our victory was sure. Death had been defeated. So to run this race of life victoriously, we need to be on the team that has already won the race. We need to put our hope and faith in Jesus Christ. We need to commit our lives and yield to the Lordship of Him. Jesus Christ is the answer to that question. And that's where we find hope. And when we do that, when you live your life as a Christ follower, you not only run this race, this side of heaven victoriously, but when we cross that finish line in this world, in our life, you will live victoriously in heaven with our Creator for eternity. After the Indy 500 Chapel service, we had a chance to catch up with John Tibbs, who's a Christian musician. He played some worship both at the chapel service, but then also at the stage, the Cooper Tire stage, where many fans gathered for their own chapel. We talked to John about what brought him to the Indy 500. Well, I attended um, Anderson, um, which is here in the area, and um, I moved down to Tennessee about last February, um, but have kept you know, kept uh, kept uh, up to uh, speed on the people here, and um, I haven't ever been to this place, um, and I'm so excited. There's a lot of people here, and I think it's going to be a good time. Dead Man Walking is Tibbs' most recent album, and he told us about the inspiration for his career. I was at a concert in about eighth grade, and it was at a church, and there was something about the thing that happened as art connected people to each other and then to Jesus, and I was like, I have to do that. And so ever, like, I mean, and so ever since I was in eighth grade, I've just been chasing after it. And um, I always thought I was going to be on staff at a church, um, but it's always been the kind of thing that I just hope that I'm able to create art that connects people to God, and I've just been pursuing every opportunity that he continues to open. I asked Tibbs about his favorite song on the new album, and he was quick to share. Silver and Stone kicks off our album, and you know it just talks about how God is able to create beautiful things out of hard situations. And um, um, ever since I was a kid, um, I have I have had a uh, stutter, and um, you know as a two are all over, it's become something that causes a lot of a lot of uh, stress and shame. Um, but you know it is an issue I have. But I think if all of us are honest, all of us have our own struggles and situations. And you know I don't necessarily understand how or why certain things happen to certain people, but I do know that our God is active in everything, and um, and somehow I end up being the person that gets to talk to a lot of people. And, um, you know, God's created something beautiful out of that hard situation because I'm able to encourage people, you, like, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all the answers because, because our God is perfect and he does have all the answers. A great morning before the 100th running of the Indianapolis 500. If you want more information about either the IndyCar Ministry or John Tibbs, you can check him out on Twitter at IndyCar Ministry or at John Tibbs Music.